But what he had already done to you guys, and this was confirmed later by high-level agency people, we were cleared hot just to go in there and smoke his ass and let you out of there based on the rules of engagement. Now, just because you're authorized to do something doesn't always mean that's the right thing to do. Uh, in that situation, which we actually talked about before, it probably would have created an international incident had we done what we were authorized to do. So instead, I told the guys, just be cool, just act like everybody's everybody's friend, let's make sure nobody's pointing guns at each other, but stay close to the car doors so that if we need to take cover, we can use these armored doors, which bullets actually won't go through the armored doors, as cover. Um, the, this guy that we found out later was a colonel, was enraged for whatever reason because you guys happened to be sharing the same road space that he was that day. And he came over and approached me and I was just like, hey man, it's cool, let's calm down. And he was obviously speaking in, in whatever language that he was speaking in, Dari, Farsi, whatever, um, Pashto, I'm not sure but he was highly animated, so I wouldn't have been able to pick up on what language it was anyways. And I was like, it's okay, it's okay, no problem. You know, and I had my rifle, but I intentionally held it down because I knew I could use it if I needed, but let's keep it so that it's not threatening, try to defuse the situation. And it worked, but the guy, as a parting gift, decided that he was, because he was doing this a lot, and then he was standing pretty close to me, and I was starting to get a little uncomfortable with how close he was, but every, nobody was pulling guns, nobody was shooting, so it was okay. And we had it covered if he went the other direction. But he did take his hand at one point in time, and he like reached out and did that and hit me in the throat, indicating he would cut my throat. And at that point in time, that's where the real restraint came in. Because yeah. now I'm wanting to subdue this guy, roll him up, and take him back for some extracurricular questioning with our people. But instead, I decided to get everybody just back into the car because they couldn't go anywhere. We were now blocking them. We got you out of there because that was the priority, getting the packs away from the scene. And uh, we just literally wouldn't let them leave until our Afghan QRF came, surrounded all of them, and then we got all the information that we needed from them. And then the next day, we went and paid him a visit with some very interesting Afghan intelligence people who outranked him. Some other people. Some other people. I mean, he was he was pissed. I mean, I kicked the shit out of him right in front of all his fucking buddies <laughs> before he showed up. So that son of a bitch did get my shoe, but... <clears throat> but point being, you showed a hell of a lot of restraint. Again, you totally could have fucking killed everybody involved in that that was not an American, and and you didn't, and you did save it from being an international incident. I want you to tell these stories because I want to show the level of restraint that you have leading up to what happened December 27th? Yep, 27th, two days after Christmas. 2018. Yep. I was sitting at home. I get a phone call from your employee at Cerakote Nation. You were working at your, it was your business. You were one of the owners of Cerakote Nation. And your employee calls me and tells me that you hadn't been to work in, I believe, three days because I got the call on the 30th. He had just left my house. He's like, ah, you know, this isn't like Don, you know. And I'm like, yeah, no shit, it's not like Don. You'd been gone for three days, according to him. I punch up your name, start Googling your name, and I'll be damned, all these fucking articles start coming up. And none of the articles, I think there was three or four of them maybe, one of the articles says you would open fire on somebody over a road rage incident. Another article said somebody had opened fire on you. Another one said, you're in the hospital. Somebody else is in the hospital. None of the shit jived. I had not met your wife, Pam, at the time. Found her on Facebook and your son, who I had not met either. And 
luckily they messaged me back and um we hit the road and spent new year's eve in the hospital where you were recovering so why don't you i know that there's only so much you can tell us because it's in litigation right now correct yeah tell us what you can about the actual incident and where it happened Sure. So it happened on the Macon County line. The shop was just inside the Macon County line, and I went north into Monroe County on the way home, and I wasn't very far into Monroe County when uh, all this went down. This Obviously, is Georgia, correct? Yeah, this is all Georgia. Yeah, middle Georgia. Um, obviously, because there is an open case, criminal case, with all of this, uh, where I've been indicted. We can't get into a lot of the specifics, but I will say that a an ice cream salesman who has a history of domestic violence. As a matter of fact, he has a documented history of domestic violence. Are those all different incidents that he's been... This is a, a, a court document where he was issued a restraining order to stay away from family members and was also ordered to undergo a batterer's intervention program. So, you know, I don't know the specifics of it. All I know is obviously this guy's got a background with it. There's a history of violence. There's a history of violence there. And he also admitted in his statement, because we've had discovery and I've seen his statement, that he was road raging. So do the other people that were with him. Before we get into specifics, what are you being indicted for? Aggravated assault. And I think it's possession of a firearm during the commission of a crime, I want to say, is the other one. Okay. Something to do with having a firearm while it went down. Right now, I already know the answer to this, but you need to say it. Are you innocent? Fuck yeah, I'm innocent. They literally have the situation 180 degrees. And think about it. He gives a statement, I'm fucking bleeding out on the ground and then go to the trauma center where I later, 24 hours later, more than 24 hours later, undergo brain surgery. I never said much of anything until over two weeks later when I was well enough to actually tell my side of what had just went down that, or what had went down that day. Uh, But by that time, a strange thing had gone really disturbingly wrong. Apparently, even though they had my driver's license, got my license plate on my pickup truck, got my VIN number, got everything they need to identify who I am, they pulled the background of a career felon. Instead of you? Instead of me, they literally told Pam, and you know what, she's going to do a much better job of telling that story than I can, but the guy said that I was a career felon with a rap sheet as long as your arm, including that with felony convictions including drug convictions who had no legal right to be in possession of a firearm so they threw everything out the window it seems and just said yeah he's guilty let's wrap this shit up and go home boys but did they think you were dead i you know i can only speculate but it seems like they thought i was dead or about to die So they just blamed the shit on me and said, let's wrap this up and go home. What did you get shot in the head with? A thirty-eight revolver. A thirty-eight. Yep. Little snub nose pistol. I knew what it was as soon as I saw it, as soon as he was pointing it at me. I want to put a picture up right now on YouTube showing where you got shot in the head. Okay. So there it is. Yeah, it's not pretty. Yeah. In fact, it's pretty gnarly. Yeah. Chick stig scars, though, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you shot in the head by a thirty-eight revolver. Were you, I mean, was it instant lights out? There's, there's not a whole hell of a lot of people in the world that live to tell the tale of being shot in the head. Was it lights out? Do you, do you remember... I don't remember being hit. Okay. What's your first memory after being hit? Um, There was some real foggy stuff. I was in and out of consciousness. Um, 
the, the first real memory I was actually in the emergency room of this trauma center being wheeled around uh, because I remember the movement was really, really difficult because moving at all at that point, you know, with a freaking bullet in your brain was uh, messing with the, the wound, the injury. The bullet was... It, it was inside my skull. It's in there. Yeah. Is it still in there? Well, there it, it was... I, I'm guessing that it was a hollow point, and I think that's an educated guess, but it turned into a bunch of shrapnel pieces once it hit my skull. It, it broke my skull. I have a, a indentation to this day, and of course it popped or shattered pieces in other areas where I got hairline fractures, spiral fractures, just a lot of shit. And the bullet fragments went in and they're literally sitting on the artery that feeds the right hemisphere of my brain. So they're literally surrounding it. Sharp little shards of steel, lead, are sitting on top of that artery. I'll put the x-rays on the screen right now. Yeah, so a big concern is obviously with the doctors, it's common to have seizures around the one-year mark. If I have a seizure, one of those shards will almost certainly poke through that artery, and it'll kill me. Well, we're right out of here. Yep. And, uh, yep. CBD, your old brother. call sign it was lucky. Yeah. So let's uh, pray that that continues. Yeah. Well, with the help of CBD, um, because I tried using their anti-seizure medicine for a few weeks and it just made me violently ill, so I switched to CBD. Um, Now I live in Florida and I actually take medical grade CBD in Florida. Um, But that shit's magic. Well, that's good to hear that something's helping you, man. Yeah. So where was Pam during all this? You're in the hospital. We talked about your first memory. You're getting wheeled around. Where's Where's your wife? She's at home wondering where the hell I am. Well, speaking of your wife, we actually have her on the line. So, hey, Pam, how are you? I'm good. How are you guys doing? I'm doing pretty good. So I have your husband sitting here, and we just got to the part where he was shot in the head. Now he's in the hospital. You don't know where he's at. Can you kind of walk us through a sequence of events on what happened from your perspective and also how you were treated after your husband's just been shot in the head? Sure. Um, Usually Don beats me home from work. Um, So as the hours went by and I could not reach him by phone or text, um, every hour that ticked by, I was getting more concerned, scared, obviously extremely worried. Um, it was raining really hard that night, um, so I had no idea what happened. I just knew something was wrong. Um, I literally got to a point where I called every hospital in Georgia and was told that he was not at any of the hospitals I called. Um, A few of them I actually called twice um, because I thought the response that I got when I called was a little off. Um, Anyways, finally, um, my son became as worried as I was after, you know, obviously the hours went by. And... uh, We figured out Don's password finally, and my son and I tracked his phone. You found him by tracking his phone? Yes. And Don's not a bar hopper or anything like that. He's not a drinker. He definitely wasn't at the bar. You know 100% something's going on. Exactly. There's no doubt in my mind. Um, I, I, I knew I could sense something was wrong, but I just had no idea what. Um, we pinged his phone and um, it pinged behind a fire station. So I, of course, 
looked up the number and called the fire station right away, told them. 